Channel 7. Tonight on 48 Hours. This is where it all begins, gentlemen. The Commando, taking America's cocaine war into the steamy jungles of South America. Copy on that uh, party we just uh, had over. Roger, I heard it. Over. The fugitive, living the good life on a remote ranch in Bolivia. I go after my house, and, and my wife and my son would have been left with nothing, and you know I would have spent probably 12 to 15 years in prison. The informant, laying a trap for smugglers who think he's on their side. Under arrest, U.S. Drug Enforcement. Move in, move in. What do we got? What do we got? Two days and two nights on the front lines of a war the good guys are not winning. At least, not yet. This is where the drug pipeline ends, the streets and neighborhoods of America's cities. Neighborhoods like this one, in the shadow of our Capitol building, and just a stone's throw from the federal agencies battling fiercely to stem the flow of illegal drugs. But the newest war to shut down the pipeline is being waged thousands of miles from here. For 48 hours, come along with us to the front line of Washington's controversial war on drugs a line that now stretches to the jungles and mountains of South America. We consider Bolivia to be responsible for about a third of the cocaine production in the United States. We ultimately see that. And this valley is the number one growing area in Bolivia for illicit production of cocaine. Uh, my name's Steve Castile. I'm an agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration, and. I'm currently assigned right now in beautiful Chapari, Bolivia. When I first came uh, to the Chapari in January, I was just amazed by the, the massive growing areas of coca leaf. It's field after field after field. This is a whole different world. I come from St. Louis, the ultimate consumer town. Uh, I mean, no one comes to St. Louis to buy drugs unless you live in St. Louis. And I've gone from one end of the spectrum to now to the other end, the beginning. The cocaine we see starts here. And so does the U.S. government's latest effort to stop Bolivia's cocaine traffickers. What time should we try a combo check from up there? I told around noon. At this jungle camp, a team of agents from the DEA is leading an elite Bolivian paramilitary force in the drug war. They are backed up by a special unit of U.S. Army Green Berets, who, along with others in this broadcast, asked that their faces not be shown. Their tactics... Search and destroy. Ah. Aquí. This is where it all begins, gentlemen. That's uh, leaves, coca leaves are being processed in the pit right now. Basically, they do not make final product cocaine at this location. They start out and they make the, the paste form, or the first step in it. That's where they actually take the leaves that have been picked off the bush. And they treat them with the chemicals to get a product that looks kind of like a dirty, uh, dirty clay color. And that's your cocaine paste. We're not going to be able to totally get people away from growing in certain areas of Bolivia, but this is one area where I think we can stop them.
coca leaves have been cultivated in Bolivia for more than 4,000 years. The Spanish conquistadors tried to eradicate coca here hundreds of years ago. Now that coca has grown into a multi-billion dollar export industry, Americans are trying too. What we're trying to do is make the cost of producing not sufficient to make it worth their time. So you're trying to hit them in the pocketbook. Exactly, exactly. Uh, there's only reason, one reason for to be involved in drugs down here, and that's money. Have you been threatened? Yes, sir. 30 days for me to leave the Chapari. And if I didn't leave the Chapari, then they were going to uh, assassinate was the word they used. The more threats we hear about, the more threats we get, uh, the more violence uh, by the narco trafficker we see is just almost a pat on the back saying, hey, you guys are hurting us. What do you think when you see a bonfire like that, Steve? Well, I guess I'm the opposite of being a fireman. I enjoy seeing a blaze if it's burning something like that. Is it satisfaction? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We we'll try to make the team meeting real short, but we've got about four or five operations we want to do tomorrow. I want to make sure everybody's... It is 10 p.m. at the Chapari base camp. Today's mission was routine. Tomorrow's will not be. We drive up there, and we're going to blow off four holes in the runway. To destroy a hidden jungle airstrip, the team will have to transport explosives into hostile territory with the help of demolitions experts from the Green Berets. We'll go along later in 48 hours. These are coca leaves that we are turning over and drying, so later we can sell them. It's legal to grow coca leaves in Bolivia as long as they are chewed and not processed into cocaine. These plants last a long time. They don't need a lot of work to be cultivated, and we can pick the leaves four times a year. That means it's a continuous harvest. The U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration is trying to stop that endless harvest by offering to help farmers grow substitute crops. But the farmers complain they never see the money. We hate each other, the police and the farmers. They should persecute the drug traffickers, not us. If they take away the source of our livelihood, what would happen to us? It could lead to a revolution. The problem is that 80% of Bolivia's legally grown coca leaves are illegally processed. When night falls, they start down the cocaine trail. We followed to a secret, illegal laboratory. Before the real work begins, the laborers or pisadores fortify themselves by chewing coca leaves. Many also smoke a form of unrefined crack that causes brain damage. First we put in the water and then we throw in the coca leaves. After that we begin stumping the leaves. We'll be stumping for three hours. And then we throw in the acid. It's just after midnight. We're deep in the Bolivian jungle, and this is a clandestine, very primitive cocaine laboratory. This is the first stage. Coca leaves, the source of cocaine, are being stomped into paste by these young men. The youngest is 14. They'll make about $10 tonight if they're lucky. It's about the only work they can get around here, and thousands of them flock in to do it, despite the fact that it rots their feet from the acid in the leaves. We all have families, so what can we do? You've got to work where you can, so you can have some money to live, to eat. The key product is not the leaves, but the liquid crushed out of them by the feet of the pisadores. We take the water from this tank and put it in here. Then we steer it with lime. 
Con este punto ya recién pues tienen que echar la kerosene. Cuando está already, we mix in the kerosene. Dawn. The stomping has been going on for 10 hours, and it's still a long way to cocaine. Are you afraid when you're working that, that the, the police or the army might come and arrest you because what you're doing is not legal? Who wouldn't be afraid? They can come at any moment and catch us, then hit and beat us and take us to jail. The brew of water, chemicals and juice from the coca leaves is ready for the final stage of production. Esto, ahora, esto hay que hacer esto, aquí. We throw in the sodium bicarbonate into the brew. And then we put it in a special cloth. And then we squeeze out the water and make a ball. Then you go look for a buyer. This is the end product. After 19 hours of back-breaking labor, about two kilograms of coca paste. To these farmers, it's worth about $200. Three more kilograms, they can make one kilogram of pure cocaine. On the streets of America, that's worth tens of thousands of dollars. And in spite of the efforts of the DEA to stop it, there's almost no way to close down little primitive laboratories like this. People here are not concerned about the consequences. They only care about their economic interests. They don't worry about what it means. What they want is money to survive. Boston Dolphin. We ready to launch? Dave Sherry, Coke Buster. And you can see Bimini is. A run over the Bahamas. This is where the action is these days. The latest drug drops and danger. It's got a tremendous coastline, many different places you can smuggle dope, dope in and hide it, and nobody's going to see it. During our 48 hours, U.S. Customs agents will fly five missions, heading out after any plane that looks suspicious. Uh, look to the left and right of the helicopter or the north and south and you'll see the water airplane records strewn all over the place. This one's upside down. These guys really had a tough landing. You go out on patrol and see a new crash. Nobody knows how it got there. I mean, you can kind of figure it out, but hey, they'll, they'll take their chances. They'll continue to do it. Oh, I'm ready. Go ahead. Agent John Baker moves out after getting a tip. Pan over there to the left of the ramp area. There's, there's a light on down there. Word is a flight is incoming with a load of cocaine. The drop to be made at a secluded airfield in the Bahamas. So our bad guy may still be on the run, huh? Yep. This one gets away. Total haul in two days, zero. No drugs, no arrests. Always next time. Yeah. It hurts to see a guy get away, but uh, you get him the next day. Sooner or later, you get him. a.m. under cover of darkness a boat sneaks into harbor somewhere in Florida a voyage from Colombia 10 days before our 48 hours began on board a hidden cargo cocaine 107 kilos 235 pounds value about one and a half million dollars what makes this operation different from thousands of others is that on this night, the people unloading the coke, the smugglers, if you will, are federal drug agents who have secretly infiltrated the operation. We can't show you their faces because they work undercover. So here's a little present for somebody. What's the meaning of all the different markets? They're probably going to different people. It's usually the way it is. This is going to one person. This is going to another. That's how they differentiate who it's going to. The DEA has the cocaine and they have a target, a high-level dealer who expects the shipment to be delivered to Miami. That's all the agents know so far. 
but they hope by following this cocaine trail, they might shut down a major part of the Colombian pipeline to the United States. Talking about a dangerous operation here? Who, who are the people at the other end? People over here are the people who uh, paid to have the shipment brought in. But they're paying our undercover agents a, a broker's fee or a transportation fee, actually, to uh, get it into the country for them. So they, th they think they're dealing with uh, transportation guys That's and they're right. dealing with DEA. That's right. And, and all these, these drug runners happen to be your guys. That's correct. Undercover. That's correct. The agents have made a contact with a Colombian who wants the cocaine put in a van and taken to a suburban Miami shopping center where he says he will pick it up. We're going to give them two boxes they think contains drugs we will not. So they think they're getting about 200 pounds of cocaine, a little Correct. more than that. Right. They're getting just a few pounds of cocaine, and the rest is what? Newspaper right, sugar. Sugar. Okay, so it's a white Astro van. That's it right there. 503, we're at the uh, UC spot. Uh, the van is at the UC spot. That was prearranged. OK, now these guys pick up, these, these Colombians pick up the van if everything works right. Right. But if the Colombians know that the van is supposed to be switched here, how do you know they're not out here already watching, uh, watching who gets anywhere near the van, including us? They might well be. That's the chance you got to take. Want to take a walk in there? All right. Tell him if he hasn't beep, beep the guy again. The guy's late. Tell him to beep the guy again. What the hell's going on? So you think they're coming? I think they'll be here. 14 minutes to find out. If they're on time. Are we worried? Yeah. Almost 20 years, I've never seen one go on time, so. Never go on time. Are we walking to the van? Two guys? There you go. There you go. All right, the crook is with him. That one, the crook is with him. OK, well, Eunice, we got the UC with the, uh, Thank God. What's going on? They apparently got to meet with the main guy to walk in back to the van from the mall. The switch may be going on just about now, then, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, walking, walking towards this the van. Walking That's the van. They're walking right at the van now. Yep. Maybe you see point out the uh, box inside, and uh, they're just still conversing. OK, the two UCs are walking away, and the crooks are uh, getting in the van now. What did you just say? The UCs are walking away. They turned the van over to the, the main crook now. He should be driving away pretty soon. The UCs are your undercover guys? Undercover guys. Okay, the van's moving going forward right there. So in layman's terms, it looks like this is about to happen, huh? Yeah. Okay, who's got the point? There it is. There it is. Yeah, it's going the other way. Good. I'm going to follow him and see where he goes. At this time, we have no idea other than his address, his home address of where he might go. Look out, look out, look out, look out. Now he's coming this way. Get it down, get it down. OK, that fan over there, right there, that's. Yep. This car right in front of us is, is DEA. That's one of us, so it's the black car. Black car is DEA? Yep. So counting you, this is three cars. This is us three, there should be three more behind us. He went under the overpass, still southbound. Yeah, 10-4, he's in the no center. Left hand lane, left hand lane. I know there's nothing funny about this, but you got the van there with the cocaine and, and five DEA cars right in back of him. Right, we're not going to lose the guy this way. <laughs> and he thinks he's driving around with with about 230, 35 pounds of cocaine. In the, That's right. That began in Columbia. That cocaine came from Columbia, comes into South Florida. It's now on 107th Avenue in Miami. Heading for whoever whoever's behind this whole thing. Receiving. OK, he's slowing up here. The van continues through residential neighborhoods to a condominium complex. Besides all the cars filled with federal agents, there's a spotter in the sky. So he's going to be able to spot us, spot for us, so we don't have to drive in right behind him. Westbound in the uh, townhouse complex. Westbound. Let's just kind of all day. Uh, 501. We're inside now. The agents can't get too close to the white van, but a secret electronic device planted by the DEA will tell them when the trunk with the cocaine has been opened. Uh, 10 to 6, I'm getting that constant signal. I'll beep every uh, half second. Okay, what he's done is he's taken all the packages and put them in a garbage bag. He's taking the garbage bag inside. Take it down. What did you say? I'm going to take it. All right, watch it. There's another car coming through here. That's us. That's us. All right, go ahead and take them off. Go ahead and take them off. Okay, everybody be careful. 
Yeah, you guys watch your ass. I'll take care of myself. Check out. Yeah. Go ahead inside. I'll watch him. You clear the house. I got him. You got one guy, right? Yeah. And uh, hopefully he'll lead to other people. The DEA did not want us to show his face. They hope he'll cooperate. They hope he'll go undercover for them and set up other alleged drug dealers. So this one's a victory, huh? It's a classic. It starts out in Columbia, works its way to South Florida. It's put right in the hands of uh, the guy who ordered it up. Agents have been on this case for months. But does an arrest like this, even if it eventually dismantles one major drug ring, really make a significant difference in the so-called war on drugs? Certainly we have some uh, enormous seizures. Certainly we have some enormous organizations dismantled. And we look at that as a step forward. But the true indicator is the price on the street. Thomas Cash, well, the agent in charge of the Miami DEA. What is the price? When I was in New York in 1982, it was somewhere around $50,000 a kilogram. Today, it's $14,000 a kilogram. Now, that tells me that the volume has gone up and the price has gone down. Sounds like you're not winning the war on drugs. Sounds like that there's a bigger war needs to be fought if there indeed is a war underway. Okay. Oh, that's good. Uh, then again, we have two choices, don't we? We can do something, or we can do nothing. For almost 10 years, this remote region of Bolivia has sheltered one of the most famous and elusive fugitives from American justice. The master of this colonial era world is Roberto Suarez. I love the land, the countryside and cattle. My grandfathers, my father, my children and myself are all cattle. I challenge the finest cowboys in any country in the world to lasso, ride a bronco or a bull or milk a cow like me. It is fantastic to see, to have a father like him. It is just, huh? he's my king. Suarez was a king, the king of cocaine, according to the DEA's top agent in Bolivia, Frank Macolini. Roberto Suarez Gomez was a rancher. He started out as a rancher. When the cocaine trade came to Bolivia, the Colombians were looking for areas where they could come in and land and use it as a uh, drop-off spot while well, he went and looked for, for paste. Most of the ranches that he's accumulated have been from uh, cocaine profit, and he is the person who started all of the uh, current big traffickers in, uh, in Bolivia in business. The American government, the Bolivian government, and the rest of the world knows that I do not traffic in drugs. I never have, and I'm not doing it right now. <laughs> Why does the, the guy come and ask your father's permission to fight it? Father is a moral authority for everything I want. And, uh, I mean, is he kind of a father? Yes, in a situation like this, you're a father he's figure? He's the father of all these families that live here, live here you know? How many? All the kids call him Papa Taita. In Bolivia, moral authority is often synonymous with cocaine profits. Corruption is pervasive. Well, you know that there are corruptible people at many different levels. I don't mean to say by this that it reaches the president of our republic. But it reaches some of his collaborators. Roberto Suarez Gomez told you that there's a lot of corruption in the Bolivian government. He would like there to be a lot of corruption in the Bolivian government. He would, uh, has and is actively pursuing uh, to corrupt people. Uh, as is obvious, that is a danger to the Bolivian society. Can you tell who's winning? 
I can. Which one? The, the one that has a shorter tail. Yeah. How do you know when a bird has lost the fight? Cuando huye, cae o muere. When it runs, falls or dies. As far as warning suspects, I'd have to say because we do have uh, valid indictments on him and warrants, that uh, he would be one of the people that we're most interested in getting. Puede ser posible. It's possible that one day they will come and assault my farm and capture me. But there is no extradition treaty with Bolivia. No creo que... If they capture me, I don't think they will allow me to be judged here. They will probably have to kidnap me. Americans see drug trafficking as a battle that must be won, but that is being lost. In a recent CBS News New York Times poll, Americans were asked about drug smuggling. The answers are astonishing. Americans say that terrorism and communism don't come close to drug trafficking in importance. What about the Reagan administration's effort to battle drugs? Americans say it is a flop. We talked to Drug Enforcement Administration Chief John Long. The price of a kilo of cocaine is cheaper in Southern Florida today than it was two or three years ago. If we're making headway, how can that be? <clears throat> Certainly that's true. The price is cheaper. And if, if you were to continue with the, the cocaine situation, you could say that the purity is better, uh, that there is indeed more cocaine on the streets than, than there had been uh, three or four years ago. Emergency room admissions are up. Deaths are up. Uh, the, the picture does not seem to be a rosy picture. However, when one looks, for example, at the high school survey, the survey of our high school youngers, uh, youngsters, in 1986, for the first time uh, in the history of that survey, one-time use, annual use, monthly use, weekly use, daily use of cocaine is down. Is your concern, Mr. Director, that increasingly your people and law enforcement people are, are outgunned? They have the less firepower than the drug dealers? We, a, a very small agency of this government, seizes uh, an automatic weapon a day. Uh, now with the, with the phenomenon of crack, the crack use triggers the flight or fight reflex. And individuals are immediately striking out against authority, be that authority a member of their own family, a relative, a friend, or the local law enforcement officer. This is, is where we're seeing the tremendous increase in violence. Better to have too much and not need it. And not have enough. Here's two. Yesterday we got a confirmation that the dope would be there. Uh, the informant's supposed to go uh, between uh, any time this morning. Uh, we want to shoot for him getting down there before 1130. It's 10 a.m. Agents in the Fort Lauderdale DEA office prepare for another bust. Confidential informant is, has bought dope from subject number one on numerous occasions before. Okay, she's a Colombian female. The description's on there. More than likely going to be two small children inside the place. One is an infant child. The other one is like a 10-year-old boy. Mommy puts 10-year-old boy on the phone, and the 10-year-old boy is uh, translating making sure that everything is understood and he's even translated to the point where he's worked out the coded phone number uh, with with the informant a confidential informant sometimes called charlie indian or ci by street agents says his source is ready to sell 10 kilos that's 22 pounds of cocaine it's a 150 thousand dollar drug deal that must go down before noon and let's remember the 10 year old kid yes he's 10 years old but he obviously knows what's going on his mother uses him to translate. The group supervisor is Mike Kane. The kids there, grab them. A 10 year old can shoot a gun as well as a 30 year old. So just make sure the kids, uh, the kid, that, that child anyhow is secured. The people who are out front, that's her. 10.05 AM, agents receive the signal they have been waiting for, a coded message on a beeper from the drug dealer indicating she is ready to do business. 
let's anticipate that there will be weapons. I want everybody wearing their vests. I want everybody wearing their raid jackets so there's no misidentification, all right? Today, the head of the Fort Lauderdale office, Lou Perry, goes along to oversee the operation. Let's do it. Okay, L1 to all units, UC vehicle is in the block in front of the house. Now, let's see what we can see here. Now, how can you see the signal, though, from here? The trees in the way, who's going to be able to see the signal? Uh, we got a unit down the end of the block, which can see him coming out of the house, and I think I might be able to see gets an eyeball on the signal. Yeah. So because of the way he does things, we had to take an extra chance and send someone down to make sure we could absolutely see that signal when he comes out. Mm -hmm. Okay, the other unit's going to have to make the call because they got a better shot at the trunk. Okay, the trunk is open. Trunk is open. The guy is putting the package in the vehicle. The package is going in the vehicle. Trunk's open. Okay, move in. Move in. He took the damn package. She probably forced it on him. There goes the van. Got one car behind. Okay, the woman's right there. She's right by him, so keep her eye on her, just in case she bolts. Take her, take her. Okay, there we go. Get her. What do we got? What do we got? No, stay there. Get on her. Don't leave her. Push her. Come on up. Yeah, she's back. She's back. We got two up here. We got no. Nope. Hold it. Watch it. Okay. Watch our right. Watch our right. Seven. Short and sweet. You okay? You okay? Just relax. I don't. Relax. Monica. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, my, 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 what are you doing? Wait till they finish. I know, they're not going to do nothing to you. Monica, no, they can Relax, relax. Monica. Maria, come here. No, I got her. No, I'm going to Huh? Stay with me. Okay. okay. All right, now. No. no. Yeah, come over here. Over here. Okay, no. Oh, I'm going to get you. My sister. My sister. Stay with her. Your sister's okay. Stay with me. Stay with her, please. We're not finished yet. We're not finished yet. No. Stay here. Go to the kitchen and sit down. What's our situation? How many defendants? We got a woman here with two kids. Two children, baby. Relax, we'll let you go. Relax. Two? We're going to let you go. Two? Okay. Two children. So we got three out here. Where did he go? Okay. You don't know your aunt's phone number? No. Okay. I'm going to give an opportunity to call a relative to come pick up the kids. There's no use putting the children in a home or if they have relatives, it'll take them. It's better for the children now. Yeah. Yeah, more idea. Antes de hacerle algunas preguntas, usted tiene que entender. Usted tiene el derecho de permanecer callado. The answer is yes. Seven kilos yeah. of cocaine. But, but they lied. Said they had ten. We're back to lying again. Everybody lies. Nobody tells the truth. No one tells the truth. Seven kilograms of cocaine. A wholesale street value of that as well in excess of $100,000. So uh, they were going to make a handsome profit on this. Uh, in terms of what we're going to do, uh, we will now bring them be, uh, to our office to be processed. Can I keep your body straight? Turn your head to the window there. Just another bust for the DEA, another skirmish in the war on drugs. If this woman is convicted, she faces at least 10 years in prison. Excuse me, sir. Can I speak to you, please? I'm a federal agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration. Yes, sir. Can I just speak to you for a second? Sure. Can we just... Part of a drug interdiction team, okay? There's been a terrible problem with drugs coming into the Washington metropolitan area from such cities as New York, Miami. Are you carrying any type of a contraband on you right now? Any drugs or narcotics or any no, contraband? You could Would you mind if I search you? Do you mind if I take a look in your little satchel there? Would you mind if I just pad you down quickly? This, too, is a front line in the cocaine war. Along with the power elite shuttling to Washington, authorities say, are couriers bringing crack cocaine into the city. Okay. Um, I pet her right side, and I felt, I felt a hard sub substance. The crack that gets through, and a lot of it does, heads for neighborhoods like this one in northeast Washington. About eight months ago, uh, I came across an individual that was bringing crack into the, into the Washington, D.C. area from uh, the New York area. 
drug agent Ken Roselle has been tracking a new element in organized crime, Jamaican gangs who are taking over the crack distribution network in Washington. Uh, they usually have uh, uh, locations in Mayfair, which we're about to pull into now. It's, uh, it's an open crack market. Uh, good night, you'll see uh, well over two, 300 uh, individuals in there uh, selling crack. The deal's still going down. He's pulling out money now. He's paying him right now. See the money going over? The money's going over. There it is. Money went over. Dope comes into the hand. Dope goes into the pocket. That's it. In the uh, past few months, the Jamaicans have basically taken over this area. Have these Jamaican drug syndicates increased the amount of violence? increase the amount of firepower? Yes, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Uh, in this area alone, there's been several shootings, uh, quite a few murders. Uh, it's just a known fact that uh, you want to be very careful with the Jamaicans. We got a New Yorker with a, appears to be a sort of rifle. And... Since January, there have been more than 75 murders in the Washington area linked to Jamaican drug gangs. That's correct. Okay. The night we visited the Mayfair apartments, Washington police raided the area. Oh, police here to protect you. I mean, why are you running for the police, huh? Hey, I got How old you, sir? Let's see. Sometimes they're very young, teenagers, maybe 14 years old. They can make uh, at least $200 a day. Yeah, you got it in increments, $100 increments. Metropolitan police were on special alert during our 48 hours. A Jamaican gang, stung by raids like this one, threatened to blow up a Washington police station. It didn't happen. The guy in the blue. Yeah. He is the guy who's been buying drugs for the last eight years. Right. We can't show you his face. He is, in the language of the street, a snitch, a drug dealer, a big-time drug dealer, turned government informant. Yeah, I've got our guy. He is now on the, uh, the passenger side of his pickup truck. They're together, and they are walking towards the uh, entrance of the house. A meeting in the night between the informant and his Miami suppliers. They have okay, met like this in Miami now. many times before. And maybe take a, uh, the tag off that pickup. But never with federal drug agents watching. Okay, I've got the, uh, what I think is the wife, the same female that was out earlier, and the uh, target still in the driveway by the pickup truck. Okay, they're bouncing back inside the house. They look uh, real happy, so I'm sure... The suppliers have ties to drug lords in Colombia. The informant has ties to the mafia in St. Louis. It is the Colombia-Miami-St. Louis connection, a connection, if all goes well, that will be broken in the next 48 hours. The Colombians in the house think they're going to sell him 20 kilos of cocaine for $300,000. For approximately 300000 yes. Because they've been selling it to him for eight years now. Right, and they have complete faith in him. Except what, what the Colombians don't know, if I understand this right, is that he got arrested, he got caught a few weeks ago, and now he's, he's made a deal with you guys. Mm, basically, yes. So how did this all come about? Uh, did, did the DEA make an offer you couldn't refuse? Is that what it comes down to? I was facing um, 18 to 20 years in prison. I have a seven-year-old son. They were going to take basically everything that I have, which is, I mean, they got mostly everything that I have, but... You know, we're going to go after my house, and, and my wife and my son would have been left with nothing. And, you know, I would have spent probably 12 to 15 years in prison. So, uh, as the agent told me, it was a career decision. What do I want to do? So the Colombians think they're just making one more deal, the same kind they've made for the last seven or eight years. Same kind they've done with this guy every two or three weeks for the last seven or eight years. He's a big, big guy. He's about 6'4", 300 pounds. He's got a fence around the back. The, what is the color of the It's the a brown stucco. I don't know who you're driving with. Who are you going to drive I'm with? I'm alone. Okay. At DEA headquarters in Miami, agents map their strategy. Uh, our main crook 
is known to be violent. He has a history of violence. But this is his residence. He does have a wife and kids in the house. We don't expect trouble there. The other two guys, one of which should be there bringing the cocaine, is either 6'4 or 6'5, depending on which one it is, and over 300 pounds. There could be a little bit of trouble there. we got to keep it. Two days after the sting operation began, the informant shows up at this prearranged spot, a restaurant parking lot. The Miami suppliers have just given him the drugs. But the operation is only half over. So we have the 20 kilos over there, but the guy's still in the house waiting for us to take the money back to him. Now our problem is to try and get the guy out of the house. He can make a phone call and more than us to this location for the money. Now the informant has to lure the Miami targets to the parking lot, where he says he has the $300,000 cash. He's going to call, I think, tell him, look, I don't want to go back there. Why don't you come out, meet me in the parking lot here. I'm okay, here and uh, what location are we going to put him in? Let's pick a good location where we can get people set up on it, shoot the car, yeah. get this well, thing put in the can. 48 hours after they made initial contact, the suspected drug dealers show up, they think, to pick up their money. So after eight years, you put these, you may have put these guys out of business if they, in fact, did what you say they did. Well, we've definitely put this branch of it out of business. Who knows what, where we go to from there. One week after these arrests, federal agents arrested three more people in St. Louis, who the informant says were his partners in the Columbia-Miami-St. Louis connection. Meanwhile, he remains a mystery man. The DEA wants to use him again in other drug sting operations. If I understand this correctly, your friends in St. Louis, these are bad guys. Yeah, these are bad guys. Like, like if they could, what? <laughs> if they could, what do you mean? Like, what would they do to me? Yeah. <laughs> I don't even want to think about it, to be honest with you. You know, it's like... Uh, well, for openers, what, they'd kill you? No, in a heartbeat. In okay. a heartbeat. That's for openers. That's for openers. If I would die quick, that would be the good part, you know? So it's like, uh, that's the deal. The A team and the Green Berets have to drive right up Main Street with a load of high explosives destined for the runway of a local smuggler's airstrip. If they start throwing dynamite, we've got explosives in the car behind, what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna do our best to retrieve anybody hurt and get the heck out of here. Uh, that's why I had you roll your windows up, roll up our windows. I'd rather get a little glass in our face and then stick a dynamite in your lap. But in addition to the danger, there are endless difficulties just moving around on the unmarked roads of one of South America's most remote jungles. Hi, 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 hi. We wouldn't make it at the Indianapolis 500, but we get the job done. <laughs> I'm off the ground. Yeah. You know, the work ain't bad, but the commute's a bitch. Legally, American agents have no authority here except when accompanying Bolivian paramilitary police. But in order to link up with the Bolivians, Castile first has to cope with their commanding officer, suspected of being on the take from local drug lords. We have given them a large amount of equipment, which, uh, for reasons unknown totally to us, does never never makes it to the field, never makes it to this location. Uh, the officers, the uh, enlisted men, when they go through their basic camp, are issued three uniforms. They're issued two pair of boots. And then what they do with those uh, uniforms and boots after that, at this time, I'm unaware. All I know is the soldiers that I'm working with in the field usually only have one pair of boots and only have one uniform. The colonel says that his boots are wet, he's only got one pair, and so he's wearing sandals. Do you believe that? Well, the Bolivian government got them. Why they have not been dispersed, I do not know. 
We came in here to go on an operation, and we came in military style. It's been 45 minutes, and we're still standing in the sun. At this point, uh, hopefully we'll be out of here in the next hour. In the next hour? Yes. Do you think the delay is intentional? I don't know. I don't know. Made me realize I'm not 20 years old anymore. Back on, here we go. Here is the very beginning of an airstrip. Who are the people who built this strip? Would they be from outside Bolivia? Well, we we always get indications up in this area that there is some possible uh, direct Colombian activity. Colombian cartel? Right. When I walked into this country, I could have I could have gone either way. I could have said this is not what the EA should be doing. But I've been uh, very pleasantly surprised. And I feel like that we are in some place we should be. Don't plug your ears, just cup your hands over yours and open your mouth. We've seen the price of cocaine, a pace, drop drastically. We've seen the price of, of the leaf drop. We've seen the price the, for chemicals tripling, quadrupling. We see people every day leaving the Chapari that because there's not a living to be made here legally. I think there's going to be a while till they land an airplane here. Here I can look you in the eye and say, we're winning the war in the Chapari. Wow, beautiful. Okay, you get a copy on that uh, party we just uh, had, over. The U.S. is spending two and a half billion dollars fighting drugs this year. Many say the cocaine war is being lost on the home front.